All right, welcome everybody to today's bacon and coffee. And of course, we have to start off with a 30 second countdown. Here we go. And it would not be anything without a guest sitting in his chair. But before that, in order to get him motivated, we're going to do our bacon and coffee open. Here we go, my friend. There we go. The bacon mug. <laughs> All right, all right. Well, welcome everybody to Bacon and Coffee. It is 2022, right? The year of the new. That's the way I'm framing this year. And I am Brian, and that is Mark. And we are here to start off the first Bacon and Coffee of the year. And of course, as soon as I started, my camera died. So I had to go get a, a extra camera, hence why we're a little late this morning. But Mr. Mark A. Smith, where the heck are you in the world today and how the heck are you? I am in Port St. Joe, Florida, which is a rural part of Florida right on the Gulf Coast. It's located in the armpit of Florida. Now, that's not a derogatory statement. It just happens to be where it is when you look at the map. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things I love about being here in Port St. Joe, first of all, my father used to bring us here to camp on Cape San Blas, which is extraordinary spit of land that goes out several tens of miles out into the bay and creates this lovely, lovely bay area that is shallow and warm and just a real delight. But the second thing is that the nearest Walmart is an hour drive away. <laughs> I have never been anywhere in the United States where a Walmart was an hour away. <laughs> It just gives you an idea of how rural it is. Our local grocery store is the Piggly Wiggly, which all the locals affectionately call the pig. The pig, <laughs> <laughs> which, of course, has lots of bacon, I'm sure. And Well, they do have plenty of bacon at Piggly Wiggly, and they have lots of merch, too. You can buy Piggly Wiggly shirts and hats and That's awesome. cups <laughs> and mugs and all those kind of things. Although I have never seen that at a Kroger or a King Supers or any other store of the national brand, so... People are proud of their pig. <laughs> yes, they are proud. Of, I'm, I, there was one in Wisconsin we used to go to. It was kind of out in the middle of nowhere. So, yes, I, I've been to a Piggly Wiggly. It is nothing different than any other store, just a great mascot. It is a great <laughs> mascot. Well, and their prices, because they're the only game for an hour away, are a little higher than you would normally find when there's competition. But who freaking cares? Right. Exactly. When, yes. when you are where you are. And yes, actually, they have a sushi department, which is pretty freaking good. So it's, it's really it's a surprise and delight. Yeah, surprise well, me. Being on the Gulf, I can imagine you have very fresh sushi. <laughs> oh, my gosh. The uh, shrimp at the fishmonger just... Uh, a five minute walk from here is just over the top comes I'm off the sure boat they is. steam it up and serve it up with their own house made uh, cocktail sauce it is a delight to have one of the reasons why i love to experiment but that's not the reason why we came here i do want to show you something though my friend before we get into the show i would love to oh look at that is that an album cover from uh who is that is that uh, robert <laughs> palmer is oh that yeah the... that's that's it, that's it, that was a picture from the from bread you know uh, the... <laughs> It is. Yes. <laughs> sort of. The, that was. That, that, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. All the suspended mm -hmm. chords. Those guys were really good at that. Exactly. Now, this is me 40 years ago, almost wow. to the day. And this was me graduating from college, you know, starry eyed engineer that had the world by its tail. Yeah. And here <laughs> I am 40 years later. <laughs> hey, Loving dude. life. Dude, Love it's, it's, it's the ten-year challenge, not the forty-year challenge. It Although, doesn't matter. I'm not. I'm not helping uh, Facebook update their facial recognition software. Exactly. Sorry. Yes, I love that. 
<laughs> One of my all-time favorite ones is uh, it was my birthday this week, and I put up my baby picture on my birthday. <laughs> and somebody else's birthday came up, too. And what he did is he put his birth his baby picture and his 60-year-old picture with him laying on the carpet with the exact same look on his face. Oh, I love perfect. it. That was so uh, – it was like, damn, I wish I would have thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> my 60-year challenge. I love that. I, I don't know. Can you actually get uh, that green shag carpeting now? Uh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You'd, <laughs> Throwback. Dude, yeah. Yeah. Just go get uh, Wayfair. They'll sell it to you, man. And uh, they'll sell you well, anything. <laughs> that's it's okay. I went through that phase. I'm done with um, avocado colored. Um, yes. Anything. It doesn't yeah. really matter except for avocados. Yeah. So, and, but, and don't forget the plastic on the furniture, too. That's oh, the my thing. gosh. Yes. The slip covers. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's always awesome. Uh, Anyway, okay. that's just just a little fun in games there, and uh, that that picture hung in my mama's uh, bedroom for forty years, and of course wow. she passed away about three months ago, and and uh, my sister said, "Hey, you need to have this in your collection." So, yes. yep, now it's now it's hanging in my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> that's <clears throat> awesome. which is all one and the same in, in the when you're in the. <laughs> right, the travel trailer. <laughs> exactly. Yes, just your bedroom, your kitchen. Apartment. Yeah, the good thing the bathroom at least has a door, right? It does have a door. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I've been in enough mm -hmm. travel trailers to know that is a requirement. I think it's it, an it, OSHA requirement or something like that. But I, we're not going to touch that one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, uh, Psychology Today launched mm -hmm. their magazine with a question: When you're at home, do you close the bathroom door? Mm-hmm. That was yeah. what they sent out as the teaser and got thousands and thousands and thousands of people enrolled. And, well, that's an interesting question. When you're at home, do you close the bathroom door? Right? You know, well, we I'm don't need to answer, answer that it. question today. I'm not going to answer that question, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and but, my, my response is, it depends. <laughs> Well, nowadays, that has a completely different connotation. You know, if it uh, depends, then maybe you might, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the places that we go before we get into the content. Exactly. Yeah, just lets people filter into the show. Well, anyway, so today, this is the first. <laughs> one of the things I decided to do this year was to interview people who write books to B2B audiences and mm -hmm. not necessarily a marketing for anything with a B2B audience, meaning, you know, anything about sales, about process, about leadership, about any of those kind of things. And so oh, you, you forgot are, marketing and bacon. Well, marketing and bacon is my <laughs> side of things. I'm not going to interview myself. You know? <laughs> I well, could. maybe I should interview you. I, I've done that once. I have interviewed right. myself once, but I changed the voice so you couldn't tell it was me. Um, <laughs> But so so what we're here to talk about today is your new book that is so new that it doesn't even have a cover yet. That's and right. I went to the website link that you gave me and it doesn't have a website Does, yet. Doesn't even have a website yet. <laughs> yeah. But it we does that... have a lot of content. <laughs> It does have a lot of content. Yeah, we, we are in pre-publication right now, which means that we're handing it out to people who we want to have a, a quick look ahead of time so we don't embarrass ourselves. And that's always a good thing to do when you bring new ideas to the world. And mm -hmm. so far we've had, I don't know, maybe 100 people look at it and we've gotten really rave reviews or people just haven't responded. So it's one or the other. <laughs> right. Well, I, I looked at it and it made total sense to me. And that's why I want to have you on the show is Thank because you. I thought the content was really, really good. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go through a series of questions I'm going to mm -hmm. ask you. And one of the things about this series is, is there are five key parts that we're trying to get across. The yes. first thing I'm going to ask you is about, you know, the book itself. Then the second part is, what is the perceived problem the client has? What is the real problem the client has? What's the solution? What's the process? And then what's the outcome? And that's essentially what this show is going to be about. Great. And so, so the title of your book is? There's actually two books coming out simultaneously. Hmm. The title of the first book is called The Nimble C-Suite. And I need to... I need to cheat here a little bit because um, I don't have all of this stuff memorized yet. All right. We should, though. I know that feeling. <laughs> and so this is it's how to align the diverse strengths of your executive team to predictably deliver extraordinary results in a transformational economy. 
And that's the, the first one. And the reason why it's the first is because if you're going to exist in a transformational economy, we probably should talk about transformational economies as part of this, mm-hmm. is you have to get the leadership team aligned before you can do anything else in the organization. Otherwise, it's a real mess. Mm-hmm. Then the second book, uh, it's the companion called The Nimble Company, a proactive, socially responsible framework for driving sustained profits and growth in a chronically chaotic world. So the first book is more strategic in that here is what you have to do to line your company up to handle socially <clears throat> responsible companies in a world of chaos where there is no new normal. There will not ever be a new normal ever again. And then the second book is about the tactical deployment. How do you actually do this? How do you create a nimble company? Mm-hmm. And so the concept, the key concept behind both books is that nimbility is required to work in a chaotic world where you can't predict the future. Mm-hmm. And nimbility is the intersection of resilience and innovation. Hmm. If you don't have innovation, <clears throat> you can't you can't navigate chaos. If you don't have resilience, you will not stand navigating chaos. It's the two together that allow you to be able to step into chaos and emerge profitable. Hmm. Excellent. So what would be the three core takeaways from this book? Let's let's just focus on, let's start with the first one. Let's go to the C-suite one, the strategy one. Sure. And what are well, the three yeah. core takeaways from this book that people would get from reading okay. it? All right. So the three core takeaways, number one is if you're going to thrive in today's chaotic environment, especially as a socially responsible company, you must become nimble. If you can't be nimble, your days are numbered because Mm -hmm. the, um, the, the chaos that is hitting the world today is killing companies that can't flexibly respond to what's going on in the marketplace. They don't have the team that can flexibly respond. They don't have the executives that can flexibly respond. So the first thing is that you must embrace nimbility. Mm -hmm. The second thing is for you to do this, you have to reorganize your executive team. And the reason why is the existing executive team model, business model cannot handle, first of all, being socially responsible it's missing some key components and some of the key players are actually unable to embrace social responsibility because of the way that their roles and responsibilities are constructed. So you have to look at the organization of your your team a completely different way. If you're an entrepreneurial company, you have to be aware of these roles and responsibilities and either change hats as the business owner or make sure as you expand, you have the right roles and responsibilities in place. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that's the second thing. You've got to have the executive team aligned to be able to, to be nimble and to be socially responsible. Then the third key takeaway is once you have that in place, then you can begin to stepwise roll out the concept of nimbility in your organization. But it doesn't happen until you, the leader, embraces nimbility to your your team, your executive team embraces nimbility. And then you can roll out the concept of nimbility to the rest of the organization. Mm-hmm. So we've got the three core takeaways of, of the, the what. Now, why would somebody, what would be the key indicator that somebody would see your book and say, I want to read this? What is What is their perceived problem that they say, hey, I want to become more nimble? I am frustrated. All of my initiatives aren't working as well as they used to. Mm -hmm. My team is really resistant to any recommendations that I make. Our embracement of social responsibility has slowed down the company, not sped up the company. We are stuck. I don't know where to go next because everything that I have been taught and everything I know isn't working as well as it used to. Help. <laughs> help is important, yes. Mm-hmm. And and so so they've gotten to that point where they're looking for help. But what is, okay, so underlying, so now we've motivated the person to pick up the book and read it. But there's always a difference between what they perceive as the problem and what the real underlying problem is. So what is the true true. underlying problem that this person has? Well, the true underlying problem is something we call paradigm attachment disorder. Mm. 
And that is the belief that what got you here is going to take you to the next level of success. That's a paradigm attachment disorder. And a paradigm is a fancy world, a word, a way of saying world view. How you view the world got you to where you're going to go, but the world is moving faster than you can imagine. The, um, the cultural influences of Gen Z and Gen Alpha are going to be disruptive beyond belief. They're mm -hmm. already highly disruptive and it's going to be disruptive even further. And I think uh, my spirit animal is a fly because I keep attracting them. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, maybe maybe the fly is there to disrupt you. You know, it, I, that's the way that I look at it. You know, it's just ah, hi there. You know, what do you want? Uh, right. Oh, exactly. Some, some food. Well, help yourself. The bathroom door is open, and <laughs> there's. Sorry, Brian. I couldn't. It's resist. all good. It's all good. <laughs> It wouldn't be bacon and coffee without dad jokes, right? Whoa! <laughs> no, these are dad jokes, so. Yeah, that too. Yeah. So, so, so that is a, an important beginning point to understand mm -hmm. is that you have to look at the world through a completely different lens. And this is probably a good time for us to talk about the transition that we're going through from the, um, from the experience economy to the transformational economy. Yes. And I want to I want to add one point to what you said before and kind of build okay. on that. And I've always said that there is no such thing as a new normal. Normal is just a setting on a dryer. It's what That's you right. perceive that is normal. <laughs> but there is no normal because everything is changing around us 24 uh, seven. Molecules true. are in motion, baby. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's so true. Yeah. Normal is is a semblance of what happened yesterday, expecting mm -hmm. for that to happen again today. Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, consistency is something uh, that we all desire, but it's it's a it's a moving target, right? It's so it's so true. There's only one place that's consistent these days, and that's the uh, graveyard. Mm, yeah. Carrying on as we do. Mm -hmm. New normal ain't going to happen, so we have to be open and available for changes every day and those are that's what we have to be able to embrace manage and profit from mm -hmm. so when you say that uh what do you call it it was um it was something about reality distortion field or something along oh that. yeah the reality <laughs> distortion field yeah well uh nimbility creates a reality distortion field mm-hmm and that, that term was originally applied to Steve Jobs, that he existed in a reality distortion field. Yes, he did. Where he would come to work and he didn't really care at all about reality of the moment. He was focused on the reality of the future that he was manifesting. Mm -hmm. And he was a nimble player in the fact that he was highly innovative and he was also highly resilient. Mm -hmm. He went through lots and lots and lots of upheavals in his career and at Apple. And still, they're the number one most highly valued business in the company and in the country in the world. They're right. extremely, extremely valuable. And and so that's an example of how you can distort reality. But nimbility is how you go about doing it. Mm -hmm. So nimbility doesn't really care about what's real today. It's what has to change so that we can be here to play the game tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And the day after, and the day after, and the day after. So, so part of being nimble is to not be bound by the past. In fact, one of the things that creates anti-nimbility is for an executive to plan the future based on their history. Mm -hmm. You have to, in some ways, ignore your history if you're going to create a future that isn't going to be nimble. Otherwise, you are anchored to the past, most of which is true, but no longer useful or even no longer reasonable. Mm -hmm. So we have to be able to step into a new reality without necessarily knowing how to do that. But that's what adventure is. It's, all adventurers are nimble. They have right. no idea what the trail is going to bring, but they're always prepared for whatever happens to be on the trail or they die. Right. Well, when you talk about, okay, so uh, when you talk about upheavals, and that's, um, let me go back to your solo layout, because my uh, camera is a little messed up today. So when we're talking about upheavals, like, for example, I think the nimbility factor, and this is something that I saw, is companies last year with supply chain had a hard time getting parts, 
right? Yep. And yep. they're just going, we can't get parts, we can't deliver, oh my God, what do we do, right? Yep. The companies that I saw that were nimble that said, okay, we can't sell this because we can't get things shipped to us, but what can we sell? That's and right. what does the audience need? And then how do we get in front of them and let them know that's there? So yes. how do you create a solution to what's the solution to this problem from the owner's standpoint of what do they have to do in order to solve this nimbility problem? All right, well, I, I'm glad to jump into that. What I wanna point out is Elon Musk is one of the greatest examples of this. Mm -hmm. He couldn't get the chips that he originally specified for his Teslas. So he said, okay, what chips can we get? And they rewrote the software for the chips they could get. Hmm. Meanwhile, Ford has a quarter of a million trucks sitting in lots outside of Paducah, Kentucky, waiting for the chips that they can't get. Hmm. That's the difference between anti-nimble and nimble. Mm -hmm. Huge difference. So really, really great examples happening right now on how to do that. So the first step is to not get locked into paradigm attachment disorder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, this isn't working. What might work? Right. We have to move to a troubleshooting, problem solving. <clears throat> there are no holds barred. There are no wrong answers. There is no uh, no uh, attack on your career if we if we can't find a solution. So let's go find a solution. Mm -hmm. You have to remove all of the fear of the unknown because you have to fail forward. The, 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 one of the acts of inability is failing forward. And failure is not the opposite of success. Mediocrity, mm -hmm. mediocrity is the, is the opposite of success. Failure and success are our roommates. Yes. They coexist simultaneously. And for every success, there is a failure, if not more than that. Remember, Thomas Edison says, I have not failed once, not even once. I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. Now, he right. wasn't referring to the light bulb. He was actually referring to his invention factory mm -hmm. where they would try things and 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 try things until they found something. Right. And there still is no one that has more patents under their name than Thomas Edison to this day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and to that point, there was somebody who uh, posted a question on Facebook and said, how, lo how long did it take you to get your first coaching client? And I thought about that for a minute. I really, you know, I've had some coaching clients, but that's really not the niche that I'm in so much anymore. But I said to myself, how long did it take? And I said, 20 years or 50,000 hours. And the, reason, <laughs> and the reason is, is because it took that long to figure out that I had something to be able to give somebody. So, you know, it's in that failure mode, you know, you had to go through all of those challenges in order to get to a point where you thought, you know what, I have something to teach somebody. Yes. And, and so, you know, not, you just can't go to, college and get a coaching certificate and come out being an expert, right? Uh, they're, they're not going to help you very much. Mm -hmm. You know, when you when you hire a coach, you hire history, mm -hmm. which is somebody who has the scars, bruises and liver damage to be able to help you go where you want to go. And ideally, the coach that you're going to hire, you know, their history is your future. Right. So we can't become a coach until we've had some history. You don't come out of college coach worthy. Right. Exactly. And that's and that's very true. So one of the things that you want to do, and it, again, this goes back to the solution and ability is, you know, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. You need right to on. find people. I've been listening to a lot of audiobooks that talk about you need to hire people that are smarter at what they do than you are at because X. they are going to bring X into your into your place. So that I think that gets back to your solution. Yes. Of, you know, if you're going to be nimble, you need to look at who's in that sphere of influence, right? Ideally, and, and with the way that we have um, the new C-suite assembled, as outlined in the nimble C-suite, is we have four fundamental roles. And we want to put people in the roles whose temperament is, is supporting of that role so that everybody operates out of their zone of genius. Mm-hmm. That nobody has to force themselves into a place. No, instead, they're operating completely out of their zone of genius where things just flow. And then the CEO becomes the choice maker and the vision maker. And so they bring in people who are really, really smart at marketing, at product development, at operations, at sales. And they... Um, 
and they and they have those people do their very very best understanding the fundamentals mm -hmm. but also understanding that you have to have a certain mindset to invent new ways of doing these functions mm -hmm. and each of those roles has a very different mindset that's required we describe the mindsets and we define the mindsets and and we and we discuss why those mindsets are critical to the success of those individuals mm -hmm. further we split the, the C-suite into two executive suites, the T-suite, which is the tactical suite. These are people with short-term responsibilities, such as VP of sales. And the S-suite, the strategic suite, these are people that have long-term responsibilities, such as vision of the company, product creation, long-term. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to separate the tactical thinkers from the strategic thinkers because their mindsets and their vision of time and resources are completely different. Right. And and as a, a corollary to that, you cannot operate both tactically and strategically effectively. I, I have a, a client who just had the realization that he can't be a COO and an engineer deployer at the same in this wearing those same hats because they require completely different viewpoints, completely different time frames, completely different skill sets. Right. And they're incompatible enough that one or the other suffers you cannot do both with excellence exactly and i and you brought up a an example of this earlier and i just want to build upon that example and where we're at and that is you talked about apple and steve jobs and his reality distortion field so he goes yeah. out and he finds scully to come in and he said to scully yeah. and scully didn't want to get involved in he says do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugar water mm -hmm. and of course scully bit but the problem is what scully brought into the business was a structure that did not match the model of what apple was that's you know, they, right they came through and he said okay you have too many you have I, and i remember when he came in it's like you have too many different computers we're going to narrow it down to a couple of computers and you know we're going to branch out into these areas we're going to try this stuff and he corporatized a, a brilliant concept and basically dumbed it down to the point where the actual people who were buying it said, what the heck is going on, right? He tried to do something that was outside of that reality. So he was more of the, you know, the C, you know, like you said, he he was more of the CFO, you know, financial officer than yeah. he was the, you know, chief brainstorming officer, the CBO, you know? Indeed, he was he was an operations guru. Right, and exactly. When you and when you have a stable product line like Pepsi, where the formula is fundamentally unchanged for over a hundred years, right, the value proposition is unchanged for a hundred years, and you apply that line of thought to technology, which changes radically every eighteen to twenty-four months, mm -hmm. and that's <clears throat> that's a paradigm attachment disorder just waiting to just disrupt the entire organization. Right. And so Jobs stepped back in and came became back to be the chief vision maker and the chief choice maker. And right. of course things recovered. Now, you know, the intention was good, help a scully build this company, but the reality is they didn't have sufficient perspective mm -hmm. to understand what they were really doing. And mm -hmm. so Scully limited innovation attempting to increase resilience but limiting innovation of course they crashed and burned until they had to recover right and that and they didn't recover until um you know basically jobs turned the world on its side with the ipod saying ten thousand songs in your pocket you know and mm -hmm. basically revolutionized not just you know the mp3 player but the music industry i mean the thing about him is his his reality distortion field was able to change the way that the world functions. So that gets down to the next piece of this. You know, we've kind of laid out what, you know, what is the solution, <laughs> but what is the process to get there? I think that's one of the key things that people got to think about is, okay, I understand the solution. We all have that, but what are the steps that people sure. have to take in order to make that happen? Let's, let's do that. I, I want to make one comment on our last topic before we proceed into the steps. Sure. And that is that Jobs, in his brilliance, understood that we had moved from a commodity-based economy, which was how computers were viewed and what, mm -hmm. how Scully looked at it, to an experience economy where mm -hmm. people were, were purchasing memorable. 
People were buying things that were memorable. If you've ever unboxed an Apple product, it is memorable. Mm -hmm. If you've ever used an Apple product, it is elegant. It is memorable. Apple was not the first to the MP3 player market. In fact, it was dang near last, but they they just ruled it because they turned the MTP, MP3 player into an experience that people wanted to repeat over and over and over again and brought prestige to their life, which is part of the experience. Right. And one of the things that Cook has done <clears throat> is he's continued to understand the experience side of things. And this is this may be really super, super simple, but it, it kind of it, it shows how all of their products create an ecosystem. So I bought, a pair, I bought a pair of AirPods, right? And I bought them because I was going on the airplane and my old, um, you know, Bose headset died. So I didn't have noise cancellation. So I bought these things. And after I got them, I said, these are pretty damn good ear pods, right? They're ear pods. Everybody says, oh, I got knockoffs and all these other things. But here's what the difference is, is I could put those ear pods in and I can go to my phone and I could play, you know, radio on my phone, music on my phone, listen to something. And then... I can turn over to my Apple TV and it says, hey, your AirPods are close. Do you want to listen to the TV? Well, now I listen to the TV on the AirPods and it has this spatial thing where if you turn your head, the sound is changing, right? And then I can, I can record using those AirPods, right? And then when I walk the dog, I can actually tell the S word. I'm not going to say her name because she's going to jump up and bite me here. But I could tell her to open my garage door through those which I couldn't do before with the last pods that I had, the last buds. So from my garage door to my TV, to my phone, to my desktop, everything is an ecosystem with that one little headset. That's right. And that is the transformation. That is the move from the experience economy into the transformation con economy. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the transformation economy is where we go from memorable to meaningful. Mm -hmm. That those ear pods bring meaning to your life because they make your life so much easier mm -hmm. that you just don't remember them for what they are. You remember what they allow you to do. You are a better person and you live a better life because of that technology. That's the transformational economy. And that my friends is where we are headed. Mm -hmm. If you're stuck in the commodity economy or even the experience economy, you got to come along and start working your way to the transformation economy because that is going to be required, not just desired, but required for Gen Z and Gen Alpha. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Ready to go back to the steps? I want to go back to the steps. Let's talk about how we get to that <clears throat> transformational side of things. All right. Well, it starts with a leader. Mm -hmm. You as a leader have to fully embrace the concept of nimbility. You have to fully embrace the fact that you don't know what you need to know yet. The release of knowledge is the start of transformation. And the reason why is because if you knew what you needed to know, you'd already been through the transformation. Right. But, but the reality is all transformation is opaque until you begin the journey to transformation. And every step reveals another piece of the puzzle that you will see the whole picture once you're on the other side of transformation go, oh, wow, there it is. I never thought I'd see that. Wow. And of course, one of the challenges with transformation is you can't market it or sell it the way that you sell products and commodities. Because how do you market something that people cannot understand or value until they have experienced it, and until that, they've gone through the transformation. And that is exactly it. And and that is one of the things that we'll discuss at the end as an example. But it's that ex in order for somebody to understand what you're selling, they have to be able to experience it first. Then they'll understand what it's going to do for them, right? Well, that's difficult when you're selling something that people aren't willing to necessarily go through the transformation until they know what the value of the transformation is. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's the challenge. It's just not just the experience. Remember, it's the fact that you are a better person after you've gone through the transformation. Your world is brighter. Mm -hmm. You are better. Yes. And 
and your life is more meaningful. Instead of having a meaningless life, your life is meaningful. And so that is a very difficult thing to sell if a person hasn't been through transformational experiences and says, oh, well, there's, there's an interesting place for me to go. I might check that out. Mm -hmm. In general, it's, it part, that's part of the challenge of transformational, the transformational economy is that the old methodologies don't work anymore. Mm -hmm. Yep. Very true. All so, the stuff that used to work for me for the past 40 years. Out yeah. the dough. So what, what's the next step? What, you know, start with step one again and then go to step, step two. Step one is that the leader has to embrace this journey into nimbility, which requires the willingness to unlearn and relearn new ideas, new principles, new strategies, new tactics. Okay. If you have paradigm dis attachment disorder, you're not going to make it through. Right. So what's the next step that they have to go through? For a so then, the, then the next step is you have to take your key players, those people that help you with strategy and those people that oversee all your tactical deployment. You have to invite them to come along on the journey. Mm -hmm. And you have to teach them what nimbility is about. You can do that through having them read the book. You can do that through engaging with us for coaching or training or consulting. You know, we're here to help people through this process. Mm -hmm. And um, so this, this, is, this is going to require some help because you need new eyes. And of course, reading the book, you're going to get some new eyes because we're going to blow up a lot of sacred cows. And we're going to in, in, invite new ideas into your mind that you're going to say, wow, I hadn't thought of that before. But that's mm -hmm. necessary for us to do this. Then once you have your executive team in order, then the next step is for you to plot a path to bring your company into nimbility. And that is the whole idea behind the companion book, The Nimble Company. And The Nimble Company focuses on how do you create processes and cultures that embrace nimbility and so that you have an organization that is upheavals literate. Now, you may not have heard that phrase before. Well, it's because we invented it to describe what we have to be able to do. Mm -hmm. An upheaval is another way for us to say execution risk. If you can't get a job accomplished for whatever reason, because you can't get parts, because your people aren't showing up, because they've taken a mental health day, mm -hmm. which, by the way, is a big red flag that you have a broken system. If your people are taking mental health days, you are screwing them up. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I never take a mental health day. Maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I thought this was your mental health day, coming on here and talking to an audience and having fun, right? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, this is my part of my rejuvenation. That's right. Right, because I'm creating uh, the experience for you, my friend, right? Oh, uh, it's, it's, no, it's not It's the transformation. Transformation. Our, well, the transformation our, is what happens at the end of this. The experience is what gets you through the transformation. True. That's true. Well, mm -hmm. and transformation, what's meaningful is always highly memorable. Right. Exactly. So we don't mm -hmm. lose memorability. We just right. add meaning to the memorability. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, you know, it's like walking down the strip in Las Vegas. There's lots of memorability, but there's not a lot of meaning. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, there can be, but it might cost you a lot of money, but we're not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> no, or your 10 foot pole for that matter. <laughs> right. So is there, is there a third step that people need to go through? So the first, yes, of course. Is... Yeah. The, the third step is to plot the path to creating a nimble company mm -hmm. and that's changing the processes and procedures and the training and the insights. And that's done through your team mm -hmm. and it's directed by you, but it's done through your team to do so. And in the nimble company, we talk about about how do you become uh, nimble? How do you become upheavals literate? So that you know what allows upheavals and you take care of them. Mm -hmm. And then you're able to spot upheavals and be able to manage them and turn them into profitability. That's what the second book is about. Gotcha. So we've gone through this whole concept of understanding the nimble C-suite, understanding the nimble company. Mm -hmm. And we've learned about the difference between going from a, you know, a 
profit-based market to an experience-based market to a transformational market all three of those things now we're at that point what is the outcome of this what is the the expectation of the ownership of the company and what is the expectation of the people working at the company well first of all being nimble is way more fun than being mm -hmm. anti-nimble that's true yeah and the reason why is because that intersection of resilience and innovation becomes a very safe place to stay and live because failure is part of the process of succeeding. So mm -hmm. trying things doesn't have a career impact. Making a mistake doesn't have a career impact. And the way that we structure things is you're going to make way fewer mistakes because everybody's going to be looking after your safety. And what we mean by that is your mental safety and your physical safety and your, your innovative safety. All those things are part of, we create a safe system. Just like when you go to the gym, you have spotters so mm -hmm. that you can, you can lift things that are heavier than you've lifted before safely. Well, we create that same kind of environment where we have spotters that help you when you go through these transformational changes to keep you from going off the rails because they're watching your blind spots. Right. And, mm -hmm. and they're making sure that you have everything you need to know and, and they're giving you coaching along the way. So mm -hmm. that, so the first thing is that you have an environment that's way more fun, even though it's disruptive and there's lots of upheavals and you don't quite know what's coming next. Sort of like a ride at Disney. Yes. <laughs> Very true. Right. Or an interview it's... on the on bacon and coffee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you never quite know where that's going to end up, do you? <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> so that's that's the that's the first reason. The second reason is because since you can handle upheavals, and we teach people how to spot, we we, we break upheavals into four fundamental categories, which is um, internal and external and foreseeable, avoidable, unforeseeable, and surprise. Mm -hmm. and, so, uh, or, and so what we do is you have people that are out spotting and looking for these potential upheavals. We get rid of the ones that we can handle. We, we, we get rid of the avoidable ones. We get rid of the foreseeable ones. And then we have people that are looking after the rest of the ones that we may not be able to avoid or maybe that are surprises. And so we put systems into place so that we have resilience around those areas. Mm -hmm. And by doing so, you reduce the execution risk, the ability for you to not get things done mm -hmm. by a very high order. So your company becomes substantially more profitable. Right. It becomes substantially more viable, becomes, becomes substantially more reliable. Now, right now, if you have a favorite vendor that can't deliver, that doesn't help you. Right. But if that right. vendor was one of those nimble people that says, well, what do we have that can fulfill the same function in a different way? You're happy. Right. Yeah. Well, as you said, with Elon Musk and things, you know, if you can't get what you need, get what you can and then adapt to it. Right. Right on. That's part that, of nimbility. Right. And it's it's understanding that. So so the outcome is number one is having the ability to adapt right but what what is the financial or you know business outcome in the long run with that well the more execution risk you avoid <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah um the more profits you get to keep because businesses don't have problems they have expenses execution risk increases the expenses that business have so from a profitability standpoint you're substantially higher in profits because your team's not burned up in chasing fires mm -hmm. and your organization isn't chewing up um, uh, resources attempting to handle things that could have been handled ahead of time and so there's a substantially higher probability of profit and a higher probability of viability which is going to make your investors substantially higher. It also means that your customers become much more loyal because they can count on you to deliver. Right. That's huge. Huge. Yeah, that is huge. So so let's kind of go through this and summarize it one more time. And, and, and you know, the, the key thing, the main problem that people have is they're stuck in the way that they used to do things. Yeah. That's that's really the actual problem that they have. Their perceived problem is it's no longer fun. It's a challenge. It's a pain in the butt. But the real yeah. one is they're stuck in what they used to do. And so, their team. Right, right. So, and their vendors. Right. So the solution <laughs> is to actually be nimble, to be able to adjust to these things 
And then yep. the process steps are one, two, three again is what real quickly? Oh, number one, embrace an ability as the leader of the organization. Uh, reorganize your top team to be nimble so that everybody can operate out of their zone of genius mm -hmm. instead of forcing into into things that aren't possible. All innovation comes out of your zone of genius, all of it. Right. And then the third thing is develop a plan to roll out nimbility across your company through your teams, through their through management that you oversee. Mm -hmm. So. From there, the outcomes are number one, it's a lot more fun. Number yes. two, you can probably make more profit out of it. Number three, oh, you, you will, can and you can deal with the future better. So, your company is going to have a longer lifespan, better sustainability, and create more value. That's right. Excellent. Do you have any success stories based around this? Has this process been applied to a company yet? And can you talk about that? Well, what we can look at, in fact, this is where a lot of our inspiration to write the book was, was to find organizations that are exceedingly nimble. Okay. And, and of course, we've mentioned two today, right. Apple, specifically through G Steve Jobs and his capacity to create reality distortion fields, which is another way of saying nimbility, and Elon Musk giving his examples of how to do that. But we can also take a look at historic figures, such as Thomas Edison, mm -hmm. who went from failure to failure to success to success, changing the world in the meantime forever. Heck, he invented the phonograph. He invented the uh, talking motion picture. Mm -hmm. He invented the electric light bulb. Oh, yeah. But, you know, he also invented the process of making concrete, which is still used today. Mm -hmm. Those rotating tubes that are in, at an angle, was, and Thomas Edison invented that. Mm-hmm. And so his, his ability to move from problem to problem, problems didn't stop him, they encouraged him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have many, many, many examples of history where organizations were formed primarily by the force and will of the founder. And what we're doing is putting this into a package that others can then use without necessarily having to take on the persona of those individuals. One of the things that we talk about in the book is paradigm attachment disorder to leadership styles. Mm -hmm. That has tended to be a real popular thing over the past 40 years, um, maybe even a little longer, where people say, you know, I, I want to follow the leadership style of fill in the blank, Pat. Right, Henry Ford, whoever. Of, right, exactly. You, you know, um, IBM, uh, Charles Schwab. There's just been so many different examples of that. Right. And and we point out that each leadership style is well suited for a specific scenario, mm -hmm. for a specific context. And if you have an attachment to a specific leadership style, it probably is not going to serve you as the situation changes. Right. And and so we actually break down the top 10 leadership styles and create a constellation where you can look at where they're useful and where they're unuseful where they actually create issues. And instead, what we do is we swap that out for the concept of temperament, which is your worldview. Right. Instead, I want, I want you as the CEO to have a choice maker and, and vision maker worldview, and that's a specific worldview that we can define and we can actually measure. Mm -hmm. And each of, the, each of the people in your executive team have to have complementary worldviews that fill in your blind spots in the areas where you don't have those skills. Right. And again, for each one of those roles and responsibilities, we can identify the worldview that is most efficient, most powerful, the one where the, the person can operate out of their zone of genius so that you can write and match the person to the role and therefore predictably run your future as a new mm -hmm. company. So I want to, I want to kind of give you, uh, you know, based on what we've talked about today, I'm going to give you a real life example for myself. And that sure. is, so one of the things that I've been accused of is um, not quitting. Um, hence why I have 750 <clears throat> bacon podcasts, right? Well, you know, that's true, but you know, people that have accused you of not quitting, I would not take their advice. I'm not taking their advice because that was the whole point. <laughs> it, that's why I have 750 podcasts. And and so when I first started the Bacon Podcast, the whole concept behind this, and this isn't necessarily a business plan, but it is a business plan. It's being adaptable, right? So the first part was is I met all these Resilient. people. Yeah, I had all I met all these people, and I said, 
hey, these people have something to sell and they're be- and they're smarter than I am. They have something, they have more experience, they have better knowledge in this industry. I'm not going to convince them of anything, but if I could bring them on my show, I could convince other people to maybe buy from them and then I could take an affiliate income, right? So I interviewed all these people with great processes around doing video, about doing affiliate marketing, about you know all different kinds of things that I was learning about at the time. And guess how much money I made on my affiliate sales with those first 250 episodes? I don't know. Could you buy lunch? No. <laughs> Breakfast? Wait, the second. Okay. Did so you get I a think, cup of coffee? Yeah, yeah, maybe a cup of coffee. I think I might have gotten a free drink out of it once. So the, then I said to myself, okay, so this is working, right? But I like the podcasting side of things, right? This is my business. This is what I do. So I'm going to do it a little differently. I am going to interview the CEOs of companies who have established brands where people would want to use it. So then I went to companies like Evernote. I interviewed their CMO. And then in the process of that, I interviewed Aweber and A2 Hosting and a whole bunch of other companies that had really cool products that had an audience that I thought, okay, now I can make some affiliate money on that, right? So if I can get some people to buy an Evernote or something along those lines. Well, then after I did that, I was able to buy lunch. I was able to get a $30 um, affiliate check every quarter, okay? So I was able to at least afford something, but that was good. I mean, I went from learning from people to learning from experts, and then I met somebody like you, and you really helped me kind of flip the script. The next 250 that I did, I said, you know what? You know where the real gold is in this? It's not in making the affiliate money. It's tapping the minds of people that are smarter than I am, right? And learning from them and kind of re-evolving and thinking differently and understanding how that transforms other uh, people's business so that I could take that information and figure out a way to utilize it in my business. Right. And that's exactly what I did. So the next 250 episodes, I said, to hell with it all. All I want to do is interview really smart people. Okay. And so so what you did is you productized your education. Exactly. Yes. Brilliant. Exactly that. So the next 250, my goal is to interview authors like yourself and turn that into not only there are two key things with this. Number one, I get to still learn from you. But number two, you're talking to the audience that I work with. And so that is one of the things that I've learned to do is create an experience around what we can do, but also transform the way that people think about their businesses at the same time. So that's the main goal of the fourth stage of this. So what are your thoughts? How does that align with what you're talking about? Absolutely, because what you're doing is you're moving from memorable to meaningful. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you're, you're, you're participating in the transformational economy. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Well done. Thank you. And that's, that's essentially, so I want to show people that there is a way to do it. Now, you know, is it generating a million dollars? You know, that's not the goal, right? The goal isn't to, you want to, business is simple. Basically, you make more money than you spend. That's called profit, right? If you don't make a profit, you don't have a business. If you do make a profit, you have a good business. And if you make exceptional profit, you have an exceptional business, right? I mean, everything is truly measured in money, but the bottom line is there's more to it than just that, mm-hmm. right? Right. You said fun. Indeed. And this yeah, is fun. fun. Right. Yeah. Fun. This is fun first, profit second, and the profits will come if you have the fun. Indeed. And if your clients are having fun, they won't go anywhere, anywhere else. Exactly. Your clients don't want to do business with people mm-hmm. who have to take mental days off. Yeah. Your ah! client is that fly. Your client is that fly going around. Like uh, that. He's just—he's—he's <laughs> he's just my spirit animal. It's okay. He, it's he's coming good. in and gives me—he comes and gives me a kiss and flies away. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. But but that is the key: is that if your clients, <laughs> if you want to maintain your clients, you have to make yourself basically unfireable because uh-huh. they can't find anybody who can do what you can do the way you can do it that makes them as happy as profitable as possible right we're in the business my business is very very simple my business number one is to make my clients more money and make them happy yes. if i make them more money they keep spending money with me right they can yes. afford what i do that's, that's right. number one the second part of my business is the people that work for me is to help them make more money yes. right if i can teach them how to do what they do faster so they can get more done in less time and still charge the same amount. Guess what? Their profit rises. So they have more fun. 
Right. And they have more fun. So I raised the profit of my clients. I raised the profit of the people that work with me. And the last piece is I raised the profit that I take home. How does that sound? Sounds like the perfect mix for a delightful life that's full of meaning and joy. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So that, my friends, is essentially the essence of what we were talking about today. Indeed. So with that being said, uh, let's let people know about you and how they can get a hold of you. And then also, if they wanted to buy your book, you know, what's the best way? Do they they ping, you know, Mark S. A. Smith on LinkedIn and say, dude, when's the book coming out? How do they how do they find out more about this? Yeah, I think that's probably the best thing to do is uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. And uh, the fastest way to get there is marksonlinkedin.com, M-A-R-K-S on LinkedIn.com. There's a lot of Mark Smiths out there. I'm Mark S. A. Smith. That'll just take, take you right to my profile. So I heard you on Bacon and Coffee, and I heard you on the, the Bacon Podcast, and I'll be glad to connect with you. And then <clears throat> let's have a conversation. Um, if there is a specific need you have, I might be able to uh, get you a pre-publication copy in exchange for an only slightly exaggerated testimonial to the quality of the book. And uh, <clears throat> otherwise, I can keep you on the list of when the book becomes available. We're in pre-pub right now. The launch date is currently scheduled for the June timeframe. And um, the reason why is because we have a benefactor that says, I love this book, but you have to make some upgrades to the graphics. And we said, OK. So we're actually in the process of beginning upgrading our graphics. Uh, they certainly communicate well, but we have to communicate a lot of complex ideas through the graphics that we have. And so this benefactor has said, we, I want to help you make this a, a best-selling book. And so we said, yes, we will. And by the way, this book is authored with the amazing Dr. David Gruder. Um, he is an astounding man. He is called um, America's IQ expert. And he shows people how to make IQ, uh, how to make, oh, IQ is the integrity quotient, how to, how to make integrity profitable. And uh, it's been an absolute delight. He's the best co-author I've ever worked with. The two of us together truly have brought some, have birthed some new and interesting ideas to the world. And um, I can't wait. We've got a lot more books in mind now that we've got this one going. Awesome, my friend. Well, it is such a pleasure having you on. Thank you for coming on and dropping some sizzling hot bacon knowledge bombs <laughs> on my peeps. I so appreciate you, and I cannot wait for the next time, man. It's awesome. Thank you. I appreciate you too, my friend. It's always a delight. Excellent. So with that, my friends, I'm going to leave you with our bacon and coffee uh, logo outage, and we're going to say goodbye, and we'll see you next week with another great author. So make sure you Happy trails. Out. Thank you, sir. All right, here we go. Bacon.